William Butler. I'm Jenny Karn. Nice to meet you. Yeah, so we are, yes, co-founders of Butler Inc. Uh, we are a content development firm uh, that specializes in data visualization, of course, or data visualization. I tell you, when you say that word as often as I do, you start to, you actually don't get better at it, you actually get worse at it. So this is why we also call it data viz in the industry, because it's way fewer syllables, way easier to say. So we have a content development firm. We focus on data viz, also social media and uh, Wikipedia engagement, but that's not the subject of this talk. Um, so the, the two of us, we come from a not only a non-programmer background, we also come from a non-designer background, which is somewhat unusual for people who lead a company that's doing these kinds of projects. Um, both of us started as journalists to begin with. Um, and so through the, our time meeting this company, uh, we've had the opportunity to work with a lot of people who actually do know how to you know, do things like uh, program using, the R, use, using the, the R programming language or uh, the D3 uh, JavaScript library, things that we'll never be able to do. However, by working with them, we've learned a lot about the process, and uh, you know, we've, 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 we've used these tools to help uh, brands such as the NBA, Google, and um, what's the last one? Nat Geo. Nat Geo, and Nat Geo uh, to you know, help to, to visualize data to share with their audiences. And that's what we'll begin doing. Um, so through the course of this presentation, you know, we're going to be talking both um, some theoretical aspects of this, um, hopefully not too abstract and you know, still interesting to you, and also some practical tips. Jenny will have the more practical tips, so when she starts talking, that's when you'll actually want to pull out your pen or start typing. Um, you know, through this, uh, we want you to pick up some best practices for approaching creating data visualizations. Uh, including selecting the best platforms and tools. So why should we do this? Why should we, every, every presentation needs a why do this slide. And I, this one I feel, this is a little silly because I think everybody loves a good infographic. Everybody gets the power of images. Like from the, you know, 50,000 years ago on the Serengeti plain and, you know, long before that while, you know, human beings were evolving, um, you know, the sense of sight was crucial to our survival with large beasts such as those pictured in this uh, deck uh, roaming the, you know, the roaming around. I, I, was, I was planning to say during this talk that the, you know, human sense of sight is the most powerful, you know, sense that we have. But as I was researching this, uh, I kept finding all these pages on Google that were telling me that it's actually the sense of smell. I, I disagree, because I, I can't smell the difference between a woolly mammoth and a saber-toothed cat from 50 yards away, but I can see them, and our sense of sight is so powerful that we can process them in parallel and start to make decisions about the threats that we see. Um, so as we are visualizing these creatures, you know, not only are we seeing them, we're actually visualizing data as we go about it. Um, uh, what is the next thing I'm supposed to say here? I don't recall. <laughs> so text has only been oh, around yeah, for a few thousand years. So although you know, humans have been processing visual images for much, much longer than that, and our brains actually evolved to allow us to do that, text is something relatively new. We've, we've kept to scan individual characters, put those together into words, string those words together into messages, understand that message, and then we can decide which of these two beasts is a greater threat and which one we need to address first. Numbers are pretty similar to that takes just as long to analyze a whole string of numbers. But by visualizing data, we're able to help humans quickly analyze several pieces of information, the size, the aggressiveness, the speed of these two animals, and allow them to decide which one they need to be more afraid of faster. And you know, it's a lot easier than looking up a Wikipedia page to learn these info, pieces of info. So basically, the point of this slide was, if you value your life at all, you will learn to show, not tell, and you'll visualize your data. Thank you for the quick save. Um, now that we have appropriately demonstrated that data visualization is a matter of life and death, um, let's talk a little bit about how we get down to it. Uh, so hey, you know, uh, the fact of the matter is, just because you have visualized some data, that's not good enough. Certainly, 
a bar chart or a diagram can be just as boring as a spreadsheet. Uh, so what you have to do is move from just the raw numbers to actually figure out what is the story that those numbers are trying to tell. So this is going to be a recurring theme throughout the talk here, that telling a story is of paramount importance, and figuring out how you can marshal the data to help you do that and put that in a way that is intelligible is absolutely key. Did I have more points on the slide too? <laughs> you did. <laughs> so every, er, every narrative has two things. Number uh, one, it needs to be supported by analysis. We're not up here to tell lies. We're not up here to manipulate data. That's certainly not what we're trying to convey in this talk for sure. The second thing is it has to have a point. Data visualization doesn't exist just to make pretty number pictures. <laughs> what we're trying to do is communicate messages, tell our story, tell it quickly, tell it effectively, help our audience understand it. So an effective data visualization will always have those two things, be based on analysis and have a, a very clear point. Thank you. Um, so let's do a little bit of, so I have some examples of data viz in business history. I promise the history lesson will be very short. Uh, but we'll start here with, uh, well, the beginning of it, actually. Uh, William Playfair was a Scotsman who lived in the 18th and 19th century. And uh, he is remembered only by designers for having invented the pie chart, the bar chart, uh, the, the, the circle chart, and the uh, line graph as well. So pretty influential stuff. Uh, I love this one. This is the universal commercial history um, of the world. It's a colorized version. It looks prettier with the colors, of course. So you don't need to know a thing about, you know, other, other than what I just told you, you don't need to know anything else except being able to, you know, read the names of the company, need, read the names of the countries. But it, you know, begins with Egypt and the Babylonians as the global powers, such as global was back then, uh, at the dawn of recorded history. And uh, at the present day of Mr. Playfair's time, it was England, France, uh, the United States, and Russia as the you know, global powers there. And this thing is simple, it's intuitive. This is a terrific graphic, uh, you know, and um, the graphics weren't always quite as beautiful after that, but they could still tell stories. And this is, um, you have, a lot of you probably recognize what this is here. This is the Dow Jones Industrial Average from 1900 through 2010. And, uh, you know, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's not the prettiest thing. I'll tell you what, the, the, the 20th century, uh, a lot of great data in there. A lot of it rendered quite plainly. When I was putting this slide together, I was, for a moment there, I was going to put in a Microsoft Excel, Microsoft Excel bar chart, and I couldn't quite bring myself to do it. Uh, and another thing I thought about putting in would be, uh, maybe even more iconic, would be the decision funnel. Raise your hands if you know what I'm talking about by decision funnel. Sales funnel. Uh, OK, I, I'm surprised here, actually. This is, you should definitely go look this thing up tonight. You'll probably recognize it then. This is this inverted pyramid uh, that is like attention, interest, desire, action. This maps the acquisition of leads into sales. And it was created back in the 1960s. And uh, you know, if you go to Google image search and type this in, you will find that hundreds of people on the internet in just the last couple of years have tried to do their own version of this funnel. It basically goes into, I don't know, every other business spreadsheet uh, that gets circulated out there. Uh, basically, for good or ill, it's one of the most influential data visualizations of the 20th century. Um, but I, you know, so I'm not necessarily fans of all, of all those. But here's an odd one that I am a fan of. Uh, I'm, I'm a fan recently of the business pundit named Ben Thompson. He writes a newsletter called Stratechery. And so he's a very insightful writer. Uh, and most of what he does is on a daily basis, he writes these letters that offer terrific insights on mobile computing and on information technology. But he also happens to include these, well, I don't know, crummy hand drawings. He does this all on, on his, does these all on his iPad, which I suppose actually makes this actually more impressive. Uh, yeah, I mean, the thing is, the quality of his ideas over, overwhelms the, frankly, what, this may not be like super attractive, but it conveys his ideas 
brilliantly. It's a super effective data viz. It's a DIY world, and uh, all he needs is a good idea and needs to figure out how to visualize it properly. And so he can get, he can get people to pay attention to this. I, I submit that you and I, we're not Ben Thompson. That guy, that guy's got some, has got some good stuff going on. If you are going to put together a presentation with data visualization, I submit that you put a little more time into the presentation of it. So the first step, of course, in a data visualization is unsurprisingly data. So I want to talk a little bit about where we can find data, what are different types and sources. So the first one is data you've collected. And this is probably something that a lot of you, if you're entrepreneurs in this room, have a lot of. You know, it might be sales data that you're collecting. It might be data about a certain market that you're trying to enter. It might be data about potential competitors that you're trying to talk to your investors about. So data you've collected is probably something that you come in contact with a lot. The thing about that is sometimes you're so close to it that it's hard for you to recognize trends. You kind of just get used to it and you sort of take it for granted. So sometimes having a third party come in and take a look at your data can help you unveil new things that were right in front of your nose the whole time. The next type is data that somebody else has collected that you'd like to highlight. So this is something very common at our agency. A lot of our partners will come to us and want, especially in marketing efforts, will want to put together something, an infographic for instance, based on data from someone else. So a great example is a partner of ours they sell a, a social media contest platform, and they wanted to create a piece of content that social media managers would be interested in. So we took data from LinkedIn to look over five years how many new titles had the word social in them, and we excluded like social worker, that wasn't included, but any other type of social, you know, social content, social, social media manager. And we charted the rise in that title. And it was amazing over just five years how many more people had that title. It's a great piece of content that really spoke to social media managers and got that offer pop brand name in front of their audience. It's a great piece of content. So this is a really good thing you can do. Um, I can certainly imagine wanting to highlight data from a think tank or market research, again, to try and talk to your investors about your market, that sort of thing. Uh, the third type is search and social. This, again, is really common among our clients. So Google search interest, for instance, is kind of its own thing that, that really tells a lot about what the average Joe is thinking about and wanting to know, learn more about. Social data, similarly, we can find out what people like and what people are talking about. So this kind of data can be really helpful for you in your visualizations. And the last one is admittedly <laughs> kind of just a catch-all for any other type of data that you have. Just because your data isn't a bunch of numbers in a spreadsheet, it doesn't mean that you can't visualize it. We can certainly turn those factoids or disparate bits of info, even qualitative info, we can find ways to showcase them in a visual way that helps people understand them faster. So unfortunately, just finding the data isn't, doesn't get you all the way there. The sometimes even harder part is actually analyzing that data. What, is, what are all these numbers telling us? What can we pull out of this? What story can we tell? So there are all types of ways to analyze data, and I don't want to A, bore you with them, and B, I'm probably not qualified to talk about all of them anyway. But I'm going to give you kind of four basic categories that we can work with of, of different ways we can analyze data for visualizations. So the first one is how much, what percent. We've all done this before. You've made a bar chart in Microsoft Excel or a pie chart, you know, any of those charts that Bill was talking about earlier. We've all made them. They're pretty straightforward. The way that we can make them more interesting, though, is by creative copy and design. So this is an infographic we made with a brand called Convey, which is a back-end as a service provider. They're based here in Boston. And they wanted to look at the Apple Store versus the Google Play Store. So we made this graphic very cleverly titled Apps and Oranges, where we're looking at the market share and the revenues of both of those services. So obviously, I mean, this is a bar chart. <laughs> let's, let's call a spade a spade here, right? But we've put it on an iPad and a tablet to try and make it a little bit more interesting to kind of move forward that narrative, draw you in. And we've got the, the dollar signs for the revenue coming out of these little faucets. And this infographic lived on a blog, so it was much, much longer. And this kind of contraption continued, and we had more data weaving in and out of it. But by you know, simply dressing up those bar charts, we make it a lot more compelling, make people stick with it longer. So here's another example. As Bill mentioned, uh, we work a lot with the NBA. We've done social graphics for them, and we're now making a lot of infographics for their stats page on their website. 
So this particular one we created for last year's NBA All-Star Weekend game, um, All-Star Weekend. So this was particularly the, the three-point challenge. So we wanted to visualize that the Spurs guard, Marco Bellinelli, won. And basically what you're looking at here is a series of pie charts. What percentage of shots did he make from each one of these locations? We wanted to make it a little bit more interesting and we also wanted to be able to show where the money ball was. And if you're not a fan of the NBA and you don't care about All-Star Weekend, you don't know what that means and we probably don't need to waste your time teaching you tonight. But if you do know what that means, you completely recognize them here in the graphic. Um, and then of course, we added a little more flair by lighting Bellinelli on fire. The NBA really loves flames. The nets, the balls, the players, the court, anything we can light on fire, they're into it. So, you know, you do what you're told. <laughs> Uh, the next category here is, is trends. So that's when we're plotting X over timeline Y. This is a really helpful type of data visualization. Uh, my particular favorite part is when you are able to add callouts. So you're lab labeling those peaks and valleys, adding analysis. You're not just showing the data, you're kind of helping your viewer understand what's happening. So in this particular graphic, we're looking at how Apple and Android completely took over uh, Wintel or you know Windows and Intel uh, in computing essentially <laughs> they completely you know, they were totally dominant before and now it's all Apple and Android so that's what this graphic is showing we kind of have some some callouts here so the next category is are correlations and of course that's a st statistically significant relationship between X and Y and we've all heard that <laughs> correlation does not necessarily equal causation and I'm not here to tell you otherwise, but it doesn't mean that correlations don't make interesting graphics. They can be really valuable and help us tell our stories. So in this particular graphic, we were wondering, did the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge have any effect on ALS donations? Remember last summer when everybody was throwing ice all over themselves? So that's what this is looking at. So to do that, we, we took a look at Google search interests, which I mentioned earlier, how many people are Googling ALS to learn about it. That's what that black line is. So you can see as the month of August goes by, that is skyrocketing. People are very interested and want to learn more. Then we also looked at donations. So how much has the ALS Association raised? And fortunately, they were putting out those numbers on a daily basis to the public because everybody wanted to know this answer, quite honestly. So that data was very readily available, and we were able to put that in the bar graph. So that's a cumulative donation amount. So as you can see, it's doing exactly what you would think it would. You know, as that peak is rising and more people are searching for it, you can see the jumps in those bars are huge. And then as the peak kind of, you know, it starts to dip back down again, the bars get a little closer together. Donations are starting to plateau. And just for fun, we threw in a third element in this graphic, which was YouTube views. So we picked the celebrities who got the most views. So the size of the circle here is related to the number of views. The color of the circle is the category of celebrity, and then uh, they're lined up by dates. So, you know, this is correlation. We're not, this graphic didn't say this made this happen, but it's still certainly valuable to, to look at this. And then the, the fourth and final category to talk about is geographic. That's anything to do with maps. And it's probably my favorite type because it's really versatile. We can show qualitative or quantitative, and oftentimes both in a single geographic based visualization. So in this particular one, again, this was a really long infographic and we just kind of zoomed it in for this particular presentation. But we were working with Google Shopping Express, which is the same day delivery service that Google launched first in San Francisco. I think they've expanded it to other cities. I don't know if it's here or not. It is, okay. Do you order anything from it? <laughs> Excellent. So when it was back just in San Fran, and I think it was at about the six month mark, they wanted another media splash. Another, we gotta get people talking about this. So what can we do? So they came to us and they said, here's our data. Can you help us find some trends in this to showcase? So, you know, what are people ordering same day? Unsurprisingly, the number one thing is toilet paper, which makes a lot of sense. When you're out of toilet paper, you don't need more tomorrow. You need more right now, right today, right now. So, you know, that wasn't super interesting to visualize. But we started to drill down and look geographically. Are there certain areas of San Francisco that are ordering certain things? And I don't know how familiar you are with San Fran and if you know the districts very well. I did not before doing this project. But uh, we found that in the financial district, which you can imagine is a lot of business people working really hard late hours, late into the night, one of the top things they're ordering same day, energy drinks. Meanwhile, in Coal Valley, which I'm told is a much more relaxed area, I don't want to say hippie, but maybe, 
<laughs> the number one of the top things that they're ordering, yoga supplies. <laughs> So it was just really kind of funny to see this difference between these two areas and you know, it wouldn't have been possible if we hadn't broken it up geographically because if you're just looking at all of San Francisco, the answer was toilet paper and that wasn't going to be a very compelling graphic. Um, so one more geographic example is another Google one, looking at Google search, breaking it down by state. So here the term we were looking at is register to vote. We were working with Google politics right before the 2012 election and we wanted to see you know, who, what states are searching for that term most. In, in this particular example, at this particular time, Alabama was. And Google's kind of interesting. They want to be incredibly unbiased and they don't want to editorialize their content at all. They're just offering it up for the viewer to enjoy. So they didn't want us to really drill down into why Alabama was number one. Now, if I were releasing this myself, I would of course want that to be the headline, like why are people searching this in Alabama? Is there a campaign or you know, a big ad, you know, some celebrity pushing it there, what's going on? But for Google's purposes, that wasn't important. They just wanted this data to be shared. So that's what this graphic was. So now we've got the data and we've analyzed the data. So all we have to do is visualize it, right? That should be super simple. So let's, let's talk about the ways we get started with that. So I say this to every single one of my clients who calls and they want to make a visualization. The very first question is, what's our goal? What are we trying to do? What does a win look like? This is so incredibly critical. If you can't answer this question, you're not ready to start visualizing yet. You need to take a step back. You need to be able to answer why are we making this? Are we trying to get a bunch of page views on our website? Are we trying to get a bunch of people to sign up for our newsletter? Are we trying to actually get sales at this stage? Are we trying to talk our investors into giving us more money? What do we need from this visualization? And like I said, if you can't answer that question, take a step back, answer that with your team, and then try again. The second thing that I think is really related to that is pinpoint your audience. Who are you talking to? What are you trying to tell them? Is this a super busy executive? You know, your investors probably would be. They don't have a lot of time to read a whole bunch of information from you. They don't want, you know, this is a 52 slide deck, I think. They don't want that at all. What they want is a quick snapshot of information, right? So we want to really think about who that audience is and what they're going to want. So in this particular visualiz visualization, we're looking at eruptions at Old, Old Faithful in Yellowstone National Park. To be completely honest, I didn't understand this visualization completely when I first looked at it. And that's because it's not for me. It is lived in a scientific journal and it was for science-minded folks to quickly understand. And this is speaking their language. And so it didn't need a lot of text, it didn't need a lot of explanation, it didn't need a whole lot of hand-holding. You could just put that in there and the audience knew what was up and that's all you needed. But if this were gonna live in a more general place, we'd probably want some call-outs, we'd want some copy around it explaining what's happening. So that's why the audience is so important. So then, you know, once you've identified those goals and that audience, you wanna pick a content type that makes sense for both of those things. So here, we're giving you a presentation. We, we knew we were gonna stand up in front of a room full of people and you were gonna look at our faces or look at a screen next to us and we preferred the latter. So we had our, our good friend Robin design this presentation for us. Uh, that, that makes sense for this particular goal and audience, right? So think about that when you're making your content. So when I was talking about that busy executive earlier, and they don't have a lot of time to read through a whole bunch of information, they want a quick snapshot. They want something they can look at, digest really quickly, and take an action on. So give them that. Give them a snapshot. Why not help them out and give them what they want? Um, you know, if, if you're trying to make a splash in the media, you want someone talking about the product that you're working on or the service that you're offering, maybe you're going to make an infographic that you can pitch out to media outlets. So you want to try to find a story that they might be interested in. This is something we're really familiar with at our company. A lot of our clients come to us with that goal and that audience in mind. So we help them create an infographic that can live and fit on a blog really easily and they can simply embed it and share it and you know, they get lots of views and the media person's happy, the client's happy, we get paid, we're happy, everyone wins. Um, and then you know, social graphics, are if, if you're aiming for social shares, you need to think about that. You don't want some full long infographic to live on Facebook. No one will be able to read it. No one wants to read that on Facebook. You're, you're scrolling through your newsfeed, you want l quick little things and scroll to the next. So if it's a social graphic, we try and talk our clients away from the big infographic and say, you know, let's give them a small, something small that you can read on mobile. That's what we're always saying to them. So again, you're just aligning that content to the goals and audience. And then the last thing is structuring your story. And I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this because you've all learned from lots of other people about how to structure stories. I know you've 
written papers before and you've been taught about you know, the thesis statement and the supporting evidence and the conclusion, this is really not that different. You want a strong title or headline at the top of your visualization explaining what you're looking at, then the data is really that, that supporting evidence, and then generally you want some sort of conclusion or call to action. Maybe it's a URL where you can go to learn more, Maybe it's a hashtag where you can join the conversation. Maybe it's something like share this, you know, whatever you want to be that, that conclusion or that call to action, you, you put that at the end. So that's structure your story. So that should be easy, right? We've told you how to collect data. We've told you how to analyze it. We've told you how to visualize it. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's not easy. I can't stand up here and tell you that it is something that is really easy to master. And the reason for that is it takes a lot of different types of specializations. You need to be a copywriter. You need to be a data analyst. You need to be a designer and you need to be able to visualize data. That's a lot of hats to wear. And it's rare that one person can wear all those different hats. So unfortunately, not every one of us is blessed with the ability to make this brilliant cat bird data visualization. But we do have some tips for you and that's what the rest of the presentation will be about is ways that you can do it even though you're not cat bird level data viz people yet. Uh, indeed, so you're right, um, it really takes talent and training to do top level work. And I have neither talent nor training. Um, I just have read a bunch of books and talked to my, de my designer friends. And I think I know just enough about the basics of visual grammar to be dangerous and to impart them to you in a way that I understand them, which is probably about as much as you need to understand them too. So let's see. Uh, I'm gonna keep this real simple. As far as theory goes, this is going to be really high level. And hopefully this will be just quick enough to keep your interest and not too quick to gloss over. So, visual grammar, even though we've already established that the written language is uh, you know, much newer and less intuitive than the, you know, than, 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 than visuals, uh, you know, there is a grammar to it. There are techniques that you can use in order to uh, capture and direct your reader or viewer's attention, and so, you know, I'm gonna go through a, a few basics. Color, shape, size, proximity, these are all some of the simplest things you can do in order to differentiate some information from others. Color, let's say that you are creating a, a bar chart and you know, one of those lines actually is more important than the other and you wanna direct the reader's attention there. So, you know, make, the, make that one red and make the others gray, I think simple enough. Same thing has to do with, uh, with shape. If you have different types of information, then make them different types of shapes. So let's say you're doing, you're creating a map that is showing the relationship between VCs and startups. Well, how about making the VCs square, making the startups triangles, and then anybody who's looking at it can, at a glance, tell that you are, there's two different types of information being represented here. Uh, size, kind of like color, it's fairly simple to, you know, to tell the difference, assuming that there's enough differentiation. Um, back to color briefly, I can't tell you how many graphics I've seen where poor color choices are made, you know, where like this blue and the green, they look so similar that you just can't tell which is which, so be careful which colors you choose. Um, and size, you should also be careful as well. When you're doing uh, data visualization, oftentimes, often but not always, the you know size of an element may have something to do with how important it is or volume, as was the case with that ice bucket challenge. The larger the circle, the more views it received. So keep that in mind. It, it, there's there's right ways and wrong ways to do it, and the good news is that it, if you can understand it, it should be intuitive. So just make sure you're paying attention, um, and then proximity. You know, by, by grouping like objects, you can help show relationships between groups of objects. Economy. Uh, economy is just a way of saying, um, for all the data that you have, focus on that which really helps tell your story. Likewise, when it comes to visuals, you should also make sure that you are not including any visual elements that distract from what you are trying to say. You know, and, and we certainly do have some graphics that we've made that are you know, fairly layered and have details, but none of those details, they, they, the details that are included are very carefully considered so that they do not distract from what the main 
point is. Hierarchy, if you are making an argument, telling a story, uh, you want to make sure that your audience understands the perspective the same way you do. So where you can, you know, tell them how these ideas fit together. So the most simplistic way to do that is, well, hierarchy in this case. We see this often in org charts, in decision trees. Um, there are many ways to show how ideas fit together, but even if you don't actually end up showing that, make sure you have it in mind so you can, was at least considered, because if you don't think about it, then it could be a liability. Emphasis, uh, also pretty simple here. You can use any number of different techniques to show emphasis. Color, size, proximity, these were all ones from before. Or in this case, we've got this starburst, car, starburst call out. Um, whatever it is, you're putting an emphasis on it, make sure that people know what the emphasis of your graphic is, period. And then abstraction. Any graphic, any chart you're going to make is necessarily an abstraction of something from the real world. To the extent that you can, and here's where I don't have like a single cut and dried thing to tell you, to the extent that you can, make it clear what your abstraction refers to. Um, you know, and speaking of abstractions, all of this last, you know, section here was an abstraction. What you like in there, take it. What you don't like or you don't understand, let it go. Don't lose the forest for the trees. I always make sure I get that excellent cliche into any talk that I give. <laughs> because the other cliche that I'm going to end my little, I think my little section with, is tell stories. Like the abstractions, those techniques, those, do not get focused on those too much. The point here is to tell a story. If they help you tell a story, terrific. If they don't, then move on to something that does. Yeah, and the, the rest of the presentation is just talking th through some tools. So the, the first section will be tools with a budget, but don't worry, I have tools with no budget too coming up, so stay <laughs> tuned. You knew we had to do this. We run an agency, we gotta promote ourselves, right? It's part of the deal. So of course, hire us to make your data visualizations. That's the number one tip to take away from this, right? <laughs> no, but really, the, the pros are that you get access to people who have a lot of different specializations. So we're not asking one person to wear all those hats. We just literally have different people wearing one hat at a time, really specializing and honing their craft. And we have a lot of experience, and we're able to put that all together and make a really nice final product. The downsides, of course, are that it takes a budget to pay all those hat wearers, and it takes some runway to get all of them lined up and doing the same project. So you got some pros and cons with the agency. If you have some budget, but not quite agency level budget, then you might wanna explore working with a single freelancer. This can result in a really high, really high quality product, especially if you find a great freelancer. But again, it's gonna be one person. So now you're one and they're two, so you've got two hat wearers, but there's still a lot more pieces to that puzzle. So you know, you're, you're going to be a little bit more limited, but like I said, it often results in a really high quality product and it's less expensive than an agency and can usually move a little faster than one, but it still does require some budget and most people won't work for free in my experience. <laughs> so the main event, tools with no budget. So what I did was I researched infographic tools that you can get for free on, on the internet. And I decided I didn't want to just give you a list of tools up here because you can Google too. <laughs> so what I did instead was I decided to test all those tools out. So I took a particular data set, which I just picked one from the air, which happened to be about beer, because who doesn't love beer? Um, so I'm looking at the top 10 cities that produce craft beers. So the top 10 being by number of craft beers produced in the city. So spoiler alert, alert Portland is in the top. I don't know if any of you are from Portland. Bill is, so he feels some pride in this. I had nothing to do with her choice of this <laughs> no. topic, but I do yeah. approve of it. <laughs> so I, I took that data set, just the 10 top cities and the number of craft beers, and I, I spent no more than 30 minutes on any one of the tools. And I just tried to make the best data viz I could with no design or data viz experience necessarily myself to try and put together something to see what the tool was all about and kind of took some notes on it. If I could not make anything even decent, I just cut it from the list. So these are somewhat vetted. There were some tools out there that just, you just they were so clunky you couldn't even make it work. So I'm not gonna mention those. So here we go. The first one is InfoActive. And I think that this is probably my top recommendation if you're interested in creating infographics. 
um, but it is not completely free. It does start at $12 a month, so you've got to make a little investment in order to get access to InfoActive. I will say this, though, I was able to get a free trial, and that's how I did this beautiful infographic here. So it, it was really incredibly easy to use. Um, you know, I was, I was able to easily upload my data, and it's probably the most robust data editor available in the tools that I looked at. You could upload in almost any format, and it could help you parse through that data and find ways to visualize it. So the others, you really had to have a single spreadsheet where your data was already very neatly organized and uploaded, but here, you could just throw up your CSV file and, and do it that way. Um, so that was really nice. Um, and I don't know if I've already mentioned this, but it allows you to make an interactive infographic. So if you're willing to pay that $12 a month, then you can actually host something interactive on your site so the user could hover over something and get more information or click and get more information. So that this is the only tool that offers that kind of functionality. So if you're interested in that, um, definitely recommend this one. It was incredibly limited in my options. It was basically this color palette or another color palette called Earth Tones, <laughs> and that's it, and the free option. I'm sure that once you pay that money, you can unlock a whole lot more options. I just, you know, for the purposes of science, did not pay $12, <laughs> so <laughs> here you go. Um, the next tool is Infogram, and I, I was a really big fan of it. It had a ton, a ton of templates and themes, and they were incredibly easy to customize. You could quickly figure out how to turn what they had designed into something that would match your data, which was really nice. One thing I could not figure out how to do, though, was move those labels. Like they're, they don't line up, and I don't understand why, and in my 30-minute trial, could not figure out the answer. So with more time or more, I guess, UI intuitiveness, you could probably figure out how to move those, but it, not in my criteria 30-minute test was I able to. Um, this tool also allowed you to upload your data directly, which was really nice. You can also upload live data, so say it's living in a Google spreadsheet. You could upload that, and then as you up manipulate the data in your Google spreadsheet, it would manipulate the data in your visualization, which is pretty cool, too. Um, like I already said, the templates were really easy to customize. Um, this one, it won't let you download your infographic unless you pay for it. So I see what you did. I took a screenshot. That's what this is. If you're actually going to release this into the wild, I'd probably recommend paying the $12 a month for this one. But for the purposes of this, a screenshot seemed to suffice. <laughs> so that's Infogram. So this is PictoChart. And that is definitely the ugliest infographic I'm going to show you. Just, we'll be honest, I made it. I can say that. But I think this tool is actually one of my favorites. The reason for that is the customization is amazing. You can do all sorts of things with it. So if you happen to have a great eye for design, but for whatever reason just never learned how to use any of the design programs, I think this would be a really great thing, a really great tool for you to use. You can easily drop and drag your images in there. You can upload your data. Um, again, live or static data you could upload, which is really nice. Um, you can easily save. If you don't pay for it, they'll put your little water, their watermark on it. But um, you know, if you pay for it, you can take that off. It was really easy to use. That website was super helpful and had lots of tips. And then it had this huge bank of imagery that you could pull. And the search functionality was really good. Like when you searched beer, beer images really did show up, which some of the tools, I was not so lucky. So um, I, I like PictoChart, even though this particular PictoChart is not very attractive. So that ends the infographic specific tools. But then I thought, well, there are lots of presentation tools out there too. Maybe presentation tools have some good data functionality as well, so let's try some of those out. So I really found only two free presentation tools with data capabilities strong enough that I felt like they were worth mentioning. Um, the first one here is eMaze. And you know, I liked this tool. It was pretty easy to use. Real bummer though is, you can't upload your data, and not only can you not upload your data, but it wouldn't even let me copy and paste a string of information into the interface. So I had to manually enter each data point. Now, this was only 10 data points, 10 cities. That's not too bad, but if you wanted to make many, many charts or you had a lot of data, I, I don't think that this tool would be very realistic unless they're able to upgrade that, um, update that in the, the near future. So, you know, depending on what you need, this, this one could be good. And then the last one is Haiku Deck. And I liked some things, but then I really hated some other things on this tool. Um, so as you can see, first of all, I only have five cities up here. That's because 10 bars wouldn't fit across. Couldn't get them all in there. But it was super cool. You could type right on, you know, you typed 412 right into that red bar and you saw it grow. So the interface was pretty cool, but the customization just didn't, you know, it didn't look great. 
Um, I, for instance, I couldn't figure out how to change the font of this headline, couldn't change the color of it, couldn't change the size of it or move it around. Again, with maybe more than 30 minutes, you might be able to, but in my quick test, that wasn't something that was pretty obvious for me to figure out. So I think if you're looking for real data viz, you're probably best to stick to those infographic tools we talked about first, but these presentation options might work depending on your goals and your audience, again, before you make your content, right? Then I have just one more tool to talk about, and it's actually not data viz, but it's such a powerful graphic design tool that it seemed worth including. So as you can see, this example is not at all data visualization, it's just a dig at Seattle, <laughs> uh, but it's Canva. This tool is, is really amazing. It has tons and tons of templates, tons of images and font options, so it can let you create a lot of really great graphic design pieces. If you're, you're working on your marketing collateral or sales collateral or you want to create your Facebook page and you need a cool temp header image, I feel like this tool could be really powerful and really helpful for you even though it kind of doesn't really match the topic of the presentation. So I, I threw it in there for kicks. I did not meticulously go through these websites uh, that offer free fonts. But I, I am a little bit of an amateur type nerd, so I do have strong feelings about, about typefaces, as we like to call them, or fonts, as most everybody calls them. And you can feel, feel perfectly comfortable calling them fonts. What I want to do is impress on you the point that, you know, your choice of font actually has a really big impact on the overall feel of your presentation. Like, I, I started writing as a kid on an early Macintosh where I had a whopping 12 font options. And it was a, a liberating, and I you know, got to realize how different it felt to write in one typeface versus another. Um, so these are free fonts, of course, in keeping with the, you know, uh, in, in keeping with the theme of this presentation. There are, of course, a number of famous digital type foundries where you can go pay between a modest and an immodest sum to buy some you know, uh, famous and really, really terrific typefaces. Um, one of the most well-known out there is a company that is now called Hoffler & Co. Uh, they are where you could get the, so the, the typeface uh, Gotham, which is, was used in the Barack Obama campaign, and somewhat less memorably, uh, is also used in this presentation here. But you don't have to do that. You can go to any of these websites and find for yourself a font that suits your mood, suits your you know, goal for the presentation. Um, last thing I'll say about fonts is take it easy. Uh, as you're not a designer, as you're not a font specialist, um, you know, it's easy to overdo. Uh, yeah, basically, if you have five fonts on a single slide, you're doing it wrong. Take it easy, be small c conservative about it, choose something elegant, and um, you'll be set. Same goes with photo editing. I didn't look at all these websites, but I have used some of these, as a matter of fact. Uh, these are not all websites. Some of these are desktop clients. Some of these are web apps. Um, I understand that Darktable comes very strongly recommended. Uh, the one I've used the most up here is Pixlr. This one is a, uh, this is a web app. It, it's like a clunkier, but yet stripped down version of Photoshop. You know, and Photoshop, which is you know, far and away the industry standard, it's essentially synonymous with photo editing these days. Um, very powerful designer's tool. Also far more than you or I could ever make appropriate use of. Uh, and you know, to that end, even though Adobe has recently changed Photoshop to a subscription model, it's still really not a great value for you when there are a bunch of these free options that will do enough. So Pixlr, if you want to make some simple edits, no problem. Don't have to, you do not need to sign up for an account or anything of the sort. You just go to the web page, open up the editor, and you can upload a file directly. Um, if you are a fan of open source software, uh, GIMP is a uh, long-standing, well, well-loved, uh, photo editing, this is a desktop client, uh, GIMP, the, the new image, something, something, that's what it is. Um, so again, in keeping with this idea of helping you, you know, this DIY world, helping you get started yourself, uh, if you go to this uh, URL on our website, you can download a free PowerPoint uh, template that we have put together. It includes 
pie charts and bar charts, uh, other inventions of Mr. William Playfair, and because we think that you are very likely to be creating data visualizations for a PowerPoint presentation, as many entrepreneurs and anybody who has to give a presentation, you know, it's often PowerPoint. This includes as well, uh, you know, title slides and divider slides. So you can customize these and the charts are editable as well. Uh, it's released under a Creative Commons license, so go forth and do with as you like. And then that is the end of our prepared presentation. I want to thank everybody here for coming on down tonight and this rainy Boston night. And thank you, Matthew, for having us in. And uh, I know Jenny and I would be more than happy to answer any questions of you uh, you have um, until they, you know, escort us from the premises. We're also taking your dinner recommendation. Oh yes, that's right. <laughs> we have no plans for that yet. Thank you. Great. Yeah. <laughs> Different answers. Yeah, yeah, you go for it. Absolutely. Well, the, the business really started as a Wikipedia consultancy, which Bill can talk more about. And then you know, we were he was gathering a lot of researchers and writers, and they were doing their thing and doing it well, and realized that that skill set, those hats, could be worn to make a lot of other types of content as well if you just could unlock that data viz and design portion. That's where I joined the firm. I had been working at a different agency previously and had a huge Rolodex of people who specialized in all of this. So by combining forces, we were able to make the info and the graphic part and had a lot of clients really interested in that. So that's, that's how, basically. Wait, wait, that, that's my story. What's your story? <laughs> that's, that's my story. I was working at another agency doing this, so I, I had a lot of experience. I, was a journalist. I got laid off four months after my started my first job. I graduated in 08 with a print journalism degree, so that wasn't really a good time to be in print journalism, and uh, an agency job opened up, and so I, I jumped in. And I, it has a lot of the same things I liked about journalism, like very different every day, and sometimes there are real races. Like Google was always, with the politics stuff, they always wanted it for the press, so it's like, oh, this event just happened. We have to get these graphics out the door, and it's like that adrenaline rush that I really liked, so. I'll just add briefly, you know, I, I kind of like brute force got myself into it because I was really fascinated with data visualizations and inf infographic, which is kind of a, you know, it's a devalued term these days because there's so many bad ones out there. I wanted to make a really good one. And so uh, about five years ago, I started working on a project based on a novel based here in the Boston area, Infinite Jest by the late David Foster Wallace. Uh, most of the locations that are mentioned in the book are real or you, they could be found. And so I went through the book and I found all the locations from the book, mapped them out to real places, actually worked with Jenny and the team she was with at the time to create a, um, a, a map that actually plotted locations from the book all over the US. And I, my first, or my second trip to Boston ever was to walk all around Alston Brighton and um, identify the real life locations the up at the corner of uh, Warren and Commonwealth is, at least when I was here two years ago, is the actual halfway house that David Foster Wallace stayed in and wrote into the book. So if it wasn't so rainy, I'd recommend walking by to have a look at that later tonight. But, I was uh, really into the little details. Yeah, that's <laughs> true. Can you tell? <laughs> sure. Um, do you find it important or not to be attentive uh, color blindness when you're in your data, data visualization, for example? Uh, red green is a common problem, but uh, you have red green there. Uh, I, I read from a potentially really junky source that four and a half percent of the world uh, the world's population are colorblind. Uh, therefore, that's actually quite significant. Is that junky source Wikipedia? <laughs> no, it's junky. Okay. Oh, oh, I got it. Okay. Go for it. Or... I mean, honestly, we've never had anyone come to us and say that that was a concern. And almost all of our work is digital. I mean, we, we have done some print pieces, but your digital work, it's so hard to tell exactly what color that's going to show up on different screens. I mean, heaven forbid we bring up blue and black versus white and gold. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, you can't totally control what kind of color is going to show up anyway. So, I mean, I certainly think that if a client 
were, for instance, targeting an audience that is colorblind, that would be a top concern. You, you've got to consider that audience, but generally that hasn't entered our, yeah, our discussion. I, I, want to be, I, I, want, I want to be mindful, although if 4% is the number, when you're creating a graphic, if you can get 96%, that's, that's, that's good. <laughs> and so, that, unfortunately, you can't make everybody happy all the time. And yeah, that might just be one that people who are colorblind have a harder time with these. Yes? Oh, good question. Uh, we haven't done any projects, so I'm, I'm not aware of that. I would definitely say InfoActive has capabilities because it's, it, it allows an interactive visualization. So there are ways that you could program things to move. And by program, I don't think you actually have to be able to program it. But yeah. uh, it didn't make it into my 30-minute test, so I can't speak from experience. But based on the resources that I saw, it did seem like there were opportunities to decide how the data would move and that sort of thing. And then we have made some animated videos that are based on data, sort of walking the user through the story through animation. Animation is a, a much more involved process, especially if you're doing it illustration-based. So um, probably not something you could learn from a talk like this. I mean, one thing that comes to mind that is in the ballpark, not quite exactly, is a, pres a free presentation software called Prezi, P-R-E-Z-I. It does incorporate animations. Again, it is a presentation uh, you know, platform, but I could think if you were a little clever, you could you know, make it do visualiz visualization that way. For what it's worth, I did try Prezi for this, my test, and it didn't have data capabilities that seemed in line with the other presentation software. So. Might, might exist, didn't make the 30-minute <laughs> test. That's all I can promise. That's definitely a, a tough question. I think almost always less is more. I mean, especially when our clients come to us, you know, they want to fit in everything. And a lot of times, you know, they've, they've spent a lot of budget on this. They're going to put a lot of time toward this. This is the Q1 effort or, you know, whatever. So it's important and they want to get as much value packed into it as they can. And so, you know, trying to talk them into, we, we can't tell your entire story. We can't tell hundreds of stories. You know, we have people's attention for only so long. Let's tell the best story we can in that time. So I find what I spend most of my day doing is trying to convince folks to, to cut it back. Rarely am I saying, we should probably add some more in there. That looks a little <laughs> dull. That's almost never the case. <laughs> so um, I, I think that you know, in, in the, like the apps and oranges, I think is the example that you're referring to, there it worked because it was really helping to tell the story. Like those pieces were helping bring you in. They weren't fluff. Like he was saying, economy, like you want everything that matters there and cut the excess away. So, you know, if we had a whole bunch of other little workers around there or something, then it could start to detract. But as long as it's part of that overarching message, you're, you're probably on point. It's one thing that helps you figure out how much is too much. So you just make sure each image tells one story. Yes. Yeah. Show it to someone else. You know, email it to a colleague or, you know, your, your friend, your husband, your wife, whatever, and, you know, just say, hey, what are you getting from this? And let them tell you. And if it's not what you wanted them to say, then you really need to go back to the drawing board. But definitely, we try and think about one story. And we actually, we didn't put it here because it's really long and skinny, so it's hard to show in this presentation kind of format. But one of our most successful graphics we ever did was, it just told one story, but it was 2,000 pixels long, I think. And it was comparing viewers of last year's Super Bowl to viewers of the final game in the World Cup. And so it's like every ball, every football was a million and every soccer ball was a million and we just lined them up like this. And you scroll down and then abruptly the footballs end and you keep scrolling and the, the soccer balls go down nine times further than the footballs. And, you know, and, and we kind of added some little call outs in here, like that's the entire population of this country and that's the entire population of the European Union. And, you know, you just keep scrolling down and that drew so much traffic to our website from Reddit, actually. We posted it there and a ton of soccer fans stumbled onto our website from Reddit 
because of that. And I think what made it so successful is it's one thing you're trying to tell. And even though we took a lot of pixels to do it, it's that one story. And it's also, who is it? Was it the Washington Post who did the, the depth of the problem with yeah. that missing flight? Um, you know, we couldn't find the flight and then they made that incredibly long infographic to explain like, this is how deep the sea is. This is, this is how far we can see. This is how far our deepest submarine has ever gone, you know, and, and then you keep scrolling and scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. And it's like, oh, maybe that's why we can't find that plane. We're not quite as advanced as we think we are. So sometimes, you know, economy, like that was a lot of pixels to tell that story, but that story needed that many pixels. You just really have to think, you know, goals. What are you trying to do? Who are you trying to talk to? Sure. Thank you for sharing. I want to ask about how a team should collaborate to go through a design process. Can you share about your procedure? Um, you could do a whole deck on that. <laughs> that is actually something that this it comes up a lot in, in our talks because we, we sort of, we think of each project team sort of like a, a stool. And every stool needs more than one leg. So you have that accounts person who's really thinking about what is the paying client wanting us to do and making sure that you know, we're staying on budget and timeline and all that boring stuff. And that's my job. <laughs> and then you've got a strategist who's probably done a lot of the data collection, and if not the collection, then the analysis and the copywriting and has helped construct the story. And then you sometimes have a three or four-legged stool, depending. Sometimes there's a data visualiz data vis expert, and that's all they, she does. She just lays out a wireframe. She doesn't do any design. It's just grayscale, placeholder fonts. She just says circle and writes the word icon in it. <laughs> and that's it in, in that phase. And that's all she focuses on. And then you've got the designer. So you know, then they post something up and you've got four people who have to come together and talk about this and decide whether we like it or what we don't like. And it's not always pretty. We don't always just uniformly say, you're right. Great idea. Let's do it. <laughs> but um, I think the, the, the best way to kind of deal with that is to try to explain what the issue is. So for instance, if, if I don't like something about the design, I don't try and tell the designer how to fix it. That's, that's not my job. He's not paying me to design or I, this would have been a very different presentation. What I'm supposed to do is identify why a client might have a problem with it. So all I do is identify the problem and I let the designer solve that problem. Go back to the drawing board and try and figure out a solution that addresses that concern. And when we start trying to give them like, oh, make this edit, make that edit, because it's solving problems and we think we're being so helpful in our heads, we're not designers and we might be giving them tips that are actually leading us astray and not really helping. Um, so that's kind of one thing that I've learned in working with designers that certainly helps. Um, with client projects, it's easy because the client tells you. You know, it's like if we can't agree, we'll just send them both options and then the client tells us, I like this one. And then it's like, okay, well, you lost because the client said that and they paid the bills. So sometimes the client is nice in that regard um, because the, they're the final decider. They just make that decision for us. Um, we like to explore a lot as well. So we do a mood board stage usually and give several different options. Let the client say, I like this, or I like that, or I hate this. You know, this color is beautiful, but I hate everything else about that image. <laughs> they can get kind of mean sometimes <laughs> on these, these mood boards. And we take that direction and, and then try and, and move forward with it. So there's a lot of different points that maybe <laughs> somewhere circled around your, your question. Um, do you have anything to add to that? Oh, no, no, this is that, that's your area, so <laughs> done yeah. very well. Uh, yeah. yeah. I was just wondering in a fundraising environment, is there a deterrent to getting too creative uh, with your imagery? Um, are you know, certain audiences wanting to see things in their particular formats? Or have you been engaged for that kind of developing data to that kind of environment? Yeah, I think that I, I've told this to Bill a lot of times. Sometimes I think that our clients believe that because we're a data viz agency, we're wizards or something, and they can give us numbers and we can just, wow, make it amazing. And it's like, if you give us you know, 18 and 24, like that's two numbers. There's only so many things we can do to demonstrate those two numbers and how they relate to each other. And so uh, we're, we're kind of going through that with the NBA right now where they have these numbers and they're like, well, can we do more? Can we do more? And you know, we can, but you know, data needs context or we need you know, what made up the 18 and the 24. Are there different types of points that got us here? And you know, they've given us more data and we've been able to flesh it out. So I definitely think, again, like I was saying, like clients in general tend to like complexity. They always want more because you know, they're paying for this. So they want to get the most bang for their buck, which I completely understand. Um, so uh, usually our conversations are more about dialing it back. Um, I've never found any of our nonprofit clients to be worried about it looking too complicated. Like that's not a nonprofit specific, 
But I definitely have found that, say, like a middle manager wants us to help visualize data to, for them to give to execs, they really want to keep it very simple because they're like, I need to tell a story very quickly that's super clear. And I, I can't have, you know, they would not like all the apps and oranges treatment. They're like, give me two bar charts, cut this crap. Like this executive does not have time for it. So uh, that's the, mo the main thing I've seen where people want us to scale it back, um, but possibly in, in the nonprofit world. And, and then, you know, we just try and keep it really clean and really clear and, and we make legibility the top concern basically, when, when we have a client who identifies that as a concern. If I can follow up, um, besides bar charts and pie charts and line graphs, are there other really simple representations that you might recommend that are overlooked in that context? We have that slide that has all the different kinds yeah, of representations. Right. Yeah, yeah if you can, can go back to that. Um, so yeah, this, was, uh, this is actually on Pinterest, if you've seen this before. We did not create this one originally for this deck. These are all sorts of different types of charts that you can try. I mean, I think um, you know flow charts and org charts. Like, I don't see that as often in infographics, but those can be really effective. But, I mean, there's a reason that you see those things a million times: the bars and the lines and the, the pies. It's because they work. They make sense. You know, you can cut a hole in the middle of the pie and make it a donut. <laughs> it's like you, you're trying to make show the parts of the whole, and this makes sense. So, um, you know. I think sometimes when we try and get too creative and try new things, we get further away from the goal of telling a story. So it's, it's really a double-edged sword. Uh, what I would do would be take like a, like with the apps and oranges, take a bar chart and then, you know, really what that thing was, not one bar chart, it was two. You had the, uh, you know, the, what, the, the downloads and the actual revenue, which, should, you know, there you can see that Apple has all the revenue on smaller downloads and Google has all the downloads, but you know, smaller revenue. So I think finding ways to, I don't want to say complicate or obscure, but you know, um, find elegant ways to be clever about it. Uh, do you have a question? A lot of the work that we do is, oh, she was asking about other types of data viz besides 2D. So do have we explored three-dimensional data viz? So do you mean like a physical element you can touch? Or just... Yeah, I mean, we've, we've certainly done, I can't think of an example in this deck where we've done anything like that. Um, but most of our stuff is digital, and so it, it wouldn't be something that we created although we have done an installation for American Express where we created all of these um, Twitter birds and other different things that were actually living there, and some of them were data-based. So I think there was like a little graph that they could mm -hmm. set up. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's just really about the designer's preference on whether we're going to do it 2D or, or 3D, unless a client identified they wanted the yeah, 3D. Yeah, and likewise, a lot of what we've shown here is, is static, because it's easier to show. And the majority of work we do are static images. But we also do interactive infographics. And this is where you need a programmer. You could do a 3D infographic. And it could be really cool if you put that together. But it's a lot more difficult to put together. And so, um, yes, it can be done, but less often. Yes. Uh, you mentioned Reddit, but I was wondering if there's any other platforms or resources that you prefer um, to measure the sort of the success of data viz out there so that we can sort of preview uh, some samples and these different variations and iterations um, and specifically measuring how they did in their specific audience. So working one on one with the client would be one thing. Well, I think, I mean, in, in client work, that's always part of that in an initial conversation. So when we ask, you know, what are your goals? And it's like, well, what are the KPIs? How are we measuring to see whether we were successful in that? Is it downloads? Is it page views? Is it you know, talk, talking a boss into doing something? And so they give us very clear 
measures of success that we can kind of see how we did at the end. Um, if you're talking just about getting general public's feedback, is that what you mean? Yeah, scale up to yeah, specifically at general. So if I, if I was catering to say the public trying to make it from a journalism standpoint, mm -hmm. um, create some data um, for the market to then land on my, my site, how well was, how do I know how well that's doing other than, you know, because there's other content in addition to the data visualization. So just trying to some analytics around how well the actual I mean I would say the things that people are oftentimes looking for uh, which are not specific to, say, data viz, but specific to any marketing or content marketing effort, would be, I think, in order of importance, um, views, shares, and conversions. Because oftentimes the goal is to get someone's email address, get them into the system, um, or finally to make a sale. And so, uh, like, uh, have been spending a lot of time around folks who do social media marketing, like, uh, ROI and um, metrics are one of those hotly debated subjects out there. Um, I think it's an interesting question about how that relates specifically to data viz, and I don't think I have a really satisfying answer to it. Um, I think it's generally seen the same way that one would look at how did this blog post you know, convert, did it? I definitely recommend visually. So that's like the word visual dot L-Y. That's, so it started really as just a place that infographics could live and it had some editors who would pick great infographics and make them staff picks so you could kind of go through. But it's a great place to get inspiration, see what other people are doing, find interesting topics. Um, I really like Visually. It's now expanding and they have a service offering. I don't totally understand if it's an automated product or if a, a human is designing it for you or some sort of hybrid. I'm not, not totally sure. I think they're kind of still figuring that out too. But it started as sort of a community for data viz but you know, people can comment on stuff there and, and you can kind of see how, how many people are looking at it. So we've certainly had graphics we post there and they go gangbusters and graphics we post there and it's like, okay, nope, that was a no, all right. <laughs> so I, that's kind of a little bit of a feedback loop and Reddit also has an infographic community and, and people will comment there and design community, I think they welcome infographics to kind of get a, sm a smaller audience to weigh in, but th those are gonna be more experts, not the general public telling you how it did. So you guys mentioned a lot of kind of free online tools that were very helpful. What, what would you say are the most commonly used programs that professionals in the industry use to create these kind of infographics? I'm, I'm assuming they don't use like the kind of tools. <laughs> no, I'm pretty sure a designer hadn't heard of a lot of these tools when she was putting this together. She's uh, like, info what? <laughs> so. I mean, the short answer is the Adobe Industrial Complex. <laughs> they make Photoshop, Illustrator, uh, all the tools that Graphic, there are, there are other tools out there, but Adobe is far and away the industry leader. And then Fusion Tables, Google Fusion Tables, I think is a, a big way that our data viz expert analyzes spreadsheets. So you can give her spreadsheets with tons and tons of sheets in them that to me is like, ah, oh, what do I do with that? And she says, you put it in the Fusion Tables and you can sort it in all sorts of different ways and that's, that really helps her come up with um, the, the core of the visualization. <laughs> oh, early on, I mentioned a couple of popular, uh, well, the language R and the JavaScript library D3 for doing in-browser data visualizations and interactive as well. Those are very, very popular. And, um, you know, if I was younger, I would go back and learn how to <laughs> use these because I think they're great, but I have to go to somebody else to do something with it. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sure, if you can find a way to structure that story, I mean, you could do it as a timeline. You, you asked if you could visualize the life of a person. Yes, yeah. yeah, so, I mean, I think I've seen a lot of infographics that are timeline-based and, and talk about different milestones. I mean, think about any biography that you've read. What is the framing device for those chapters? That could easily become different sections of an infographic. Wikipedia articles also, where it's like early life, career, um, personal life, that sort of thing. You know, you, you could find different framing devices. You just have to think about how you want to structure that story. But like I said, I mean, it doesn't have to live in a spreadsheet. You know, it can be a lot of qualitative data. It can be worked into an infographic, for sure. And we, and we do that often for our clients. Anything else? Jenny, Bill, thank you so much for being here. Thank you.